So that's the simplex method in a nutshell, but the next uh, step for us is actually to figure out circumstances in which the simplex method might fail. So here we have a nice objective function that is moving up toward an extreme point, and graphically we see that uh, that optimal solution exists right, right at that extreme point. But let's look at some cases where uh, maybe through poor formulation or lack of information in the problem, uh, we might have other outcomes. All right, so this example again is looking at the, the same two variable problem, but we've modified our z function to be something slightly different, right? Instead of the z uh, going in this direction where it was previously, uh, now we see that the z is moving um, in a slightly different direction. We're still maximizing z, we're trying to, to get that as large as possible, but we see that uh, there's kind of a complication. So our original optimal point, which was up here, um, shares the same z objective function with another point. So we no longer have a unique optimal solution. All right, this is a case where we have what's called alternate optimal solutions. Okay, in this case, uh, you can accept either of these answers. You, the, the simplex algorithm will happily find the alternate solutions. But one thing that you may want to specify in your problem is that um, once you find an optimal solution, one where you prove that you can't further improve z, you might want to set the, the solver to limit it to find just the first solution, right? Um, that's something that you can do. Uh, but in this case, you could accept either optimal solution, and then if there's something outside the problem that leads you to favor, you know, low x1 or low x2 or whatever it might be, you can choose uh, one of the optimal solutions. Um, again, this two-dimensional example is really simplistic, but you might end up having, in you know, uh, problems with thousands of uh, uh, variables or thousands of constraints, many op uh, optimal solutions that are equally as good. Um, that you then have to decide, you know, which one you're going to actually use. Another scenario that we might care about uh, will show up if the solver fails. Uh, so one of the really common ways that the solver fails is you have this type of setup. Again, we've, we've moved our objective function z so that it's pointing in a different direction. So let's imagine now that I just have, you know, one, two, three constraints and I, I don't have the case of say x is greater than or xi is greater than or equal to zero, right? I'm not, I'm not enforcing that to be the case. Um, this example shows that there is a direction where I can, uh, you know, find find an extreme point, solve for that, and my next direction is going to be to include or to uh, move in the direction uh, shown here. If I do that there's actually no reason why I would ever stop moving in that direction. Okay, so this is called an unbounded problem. Um, there, in this problem, there are feasible solutions, right? There are some solutions that are better than others. Right? Clearly, this is a better solution than this. But... Um, Ultimately, you can't successfully maximize z because the maximum is undefined. Uh, so you'll often get back unbounded problem, and that's something that uh, solvers are really good at detecting. The next example of something that comes up uh, is a problem where you can find a solution, but it actually takes the solver a bit longer to find it. So here we've added, we have our original 1, 2, three constraints, but we've added a fourth constraint. And that fourth constra constraint is special in that it exactly passes through the extreme point formed by constraints one and two. So in this case where we have uh, three lines passing through uh, in two dimensions a single point, there are three constraints, uh, or, or different, let's say it this way, there are different combinations of constraints that you can pull into the basis that give you the same optimal answer, or the same optimal point. Um, so this situation is called a degenerate. Right, so it's a de degenerate formulation. 
um, or otherwise a de degenerate point, right? That degenerate point is there. And what this uh, means is that your formulation is, uh, could be improved, right? You could make the solver solve this problem a little bit more quickly by removing that fourth constraint if you can detect which constraint is actually degenerate. Uh, you can remove that fourth constraint um, and, and actually get the same answer than, than you, uh, that you would otherwise. Another situation that we want to talk about is uh, in terms of improving the, the way that you formulate problems um, is this situation. Again, we have one, two, three constraints. Now our fourth constraint is added here where it was previously degenerate we now have added it slightly above the de degenerate point. So from this uh, graphical representation, you can see that the constraint uh, four is never actually active, right? Um, so this constraint and this constraint, these are called active. These are active constraints because the optimal solution um, intersects or involves those constraints directly. Um, three, uh, is called inactive. Right? That constraint, while it's present and, and bounds the feasible region, um, is not actually involved in the optimal solution. So we could get by without ever introducing three at all. Four, however, could never be active. It's always in the infeasible region. Um, so uh, four is called uh, dominated. The constraint number four is dominated by constraints one and two and could never be active. So in, if you're going to look for places to improve your, your problem formulation, again, the solver has to iterate through all the, all the extreme points or all the points that are um, involved in this problem. So it's uh, adding significant complexity to include constraint four, but ultimately constraint four can never play a role in this problem and should be removed. All right, the last uh, situation that comes up a lot is, again, due to poor problem formulation. Uh, and in many dimensions and many constraints, it's not always obvious that this would be the case. But here we have a constraint one, two, and three. <clears throat> and our fourth constraint, and our fourth constraint is um, now pointing upward at, at the same uh, ray angle as constraint number two. So in this problem, you can see that there's actually no feasible region. There is no possible solution to this problem that satisfies constraints one through four. Uh, so this we would call infeasible. So this type of problem will be, again, returned by the, the solver. Uh, the solver will come back and say it couldn't, couldn't identify a feasible solution, therefore there's no possible answer, um, and you need to reformulate your problem. Sometimes this can be because constraints are mathematically not formulated correctly, or uh, more often the case, the constraints are just fine, but the coefficients that you've chosen for them from some data, or the, uh, you know, the constants in the constraints are, um, uh, lead to an infeasible situation. One final thing that I'd like to point out is that uh, it is possible to come up with a solution uh, for these problems where in really complicated situations you've got a lot of constraints, you've got a lot of variables. The solver actually um, might be taking a bit longer to solve the problem than you can allow for. And actually maybe you, you've made enough progress in improving the objective function that you don't care to continue to let the solver run. In those situations, uh, you might have what's uh, called a suboptimal solution, and, and you leave the uh, solution at that point just because of time constraints or computational constraints. So in that case, you know, in this simple example, uh, we might start off, uh, you know, down on the lower left, uh, and then after some amount of time, we work our way up to this point here where we found a solution, a feasible solution, that's improved on the original solution. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, we, we cut off this the simulation or cut off the solver. Um, at that point, you have uh, a suboptimal solution. You know that um, there's, there is a way to improve the objective. 
Um, however, at the point at which you've cut off, uh, you don't continue along that path. Um, and so you know that, that uh, what you have is sort of the best you're going to get. Um, so we would call this, like I said, a sub-optimal solution. So those are all possible situations that we need to be aware of as we're solving or formulating and solving the problems. Um, again, that's a really quick overview, and there's a much more depth that you can go into on each of these to really understand um, the, the conditions for them. Um, but rather than uh, doing that, let's move forward and start formulating uh, sample problems in uh, actual programming language and learn how to solve them. Uh, and then we'll kind of see how a lot of this stuff plays out.